You're looking at three gentlemen. The one on your left is yours truly. The middle man is a medical doctor who accompanied me. But what is your impression of uh, the other gentleman? Don't be judgmental. Uh, <laughs> he is a famous archaeologist in Iraq. He was the man who discovered tremendous treasures. Where are they standing? They are standing in a newly discovered tomb. I was there just after the discovery. I was so delighted. Well, on our way to Namrud, Biblical Kala, where few famous kings lived and ruled, who was the first great king who ruled here? Can you remember his name? Ashur Nasrpal II. Kukstela of King Shalmaneser III refers to the king of Israel by the name of Ahab. Of course, we also looked at 841, where him and uh, the man who had a turbo on his wagon called the Jew met. Shamshi Adat, five, son of Shalmaneser the third. Who was he? Who was his son? And now we come to the most, in my opinion, the most important person to confirm the authenticity of the Bible, Aditni Rari III. My excitement knew no bounds when I saw this stila for the first time in the British Museum. More about this man a little later. You're looking at Samaria from the time of King Ahab. And the others, the Bible supplies us with the names of all the kings who ruled here in Samaria. Second Kings 13 verse 12 says, Now the rest of the acts of Joash, all that he did, and his might with which he fought against Amaziah, or Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Verse 13. So Joash rested with his fathers, then Jeroboam sat on his throne. And Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Now, can archaeology confirm the authenticity of these Bible names? Joash, Jeroboam. Did Adatni Rari the third know about them? I enjoy researching my own questions. In 1905, a very important Assyrian boundary stone called Saba'a was discovered in the Sinia Mountains of Iraq. You're looking at the mountains right now. And what was the message, the cuneiform message of the script? Let me show you some samples of boundary stones. This is the Aramaic for boundary stones called Kuduri. By the way, Nebuchadnezzar's name, throne name is Nabu Kuduri. Now you can 
think what his name means. I found another kuduri in Egypt at a place called Tel El Amarna, where the famous Akhenaten and Nefertiti ruled, as well as Tutankhamun. Here we've got a kuduri, boundary stone. Now what would the Assyrians ones look like? This is the Sabaa boundary stone and uh, it supply us with the dates when this great famous king Adatnirari III ruled. So on this stone you can read the exact dates. If we've ascertained the dates and we look at the Hebrew calendar we can see who ruled in his day. Would it correspond with the dates of the kings of Israel? It has become the major source for supplying dates for the military campaigns. It will be exciting to establish the dates of the kings and prophets who lived in Israel during his reign. And then the picture in the Bible becomes more exciting more inspiring. Now this is a representation of the king on the Saba'a stela in Iraq. This one is in the Archaeological Museum of Istanbul. I've been there a few times. It's a very interesting place to visit. What is the importance of the Saba'a boundary stone or kuduri as they call it? Will we really be able to establish the dates in which the kings of Israel ruled while Adat Mirari III was alive? Because this will enable us to identify him as the king who converted to monotheism. And by the way, I want to tell you, he is the king. And I'm going to supply you with info. Tel El Rima lies 80 k's west of Nineveh. You can see it on the map. Nineveh, Mosul, same place. Any Adatnirari three related discoveries here at Tel El Rima? Yes. The diggings began and the discoveries were made. Archaeology is exciting. This object, well, it's not biblical related, but it tells you something. But then they found another one when they dug deeper and deeper. While they were digging deeper and deeper, they came across. There you have it. Wow, what a discovery. Unbelievable new archaeological light dispels the darkness of skepticism. It reads as follows. Adat Nirari III and his dates conquered Damascus and received taxes from Israel, Tyre and Sidon, places which the Bible mentions. On his way home, he erected a stela at Tel Al Rima to commemorate his victories. For the first time, archaeologists got this information. This was exciting. They continue reading. And then they came to a place where he refers to a king of Israel. Can you imagine their excitement? Another biblical figure in stone. He says, I have received taxes from Joash of Samaria and the inhabitants of Tyre and Sidon. Sure. Taxes from Joash, king of Samaria. So here we have another king who had contact with a king in Israel. 
if he received taxes from Joas of Israel, there must have been some diplomatic ties, conversations. Did he perhaps speak to a faithful Israelite who mentioned the existence of Yahweh, the invisible sole ruler of the universe, the creator God? Did he perhaps meet up with Elisha? Was his heart touched when he saw these godly men? I've got many more questions and answers. Let's review the contract, the contact between Shalmaneser III and King Jew of Israel. Here you see five tribute bearers from Israel with silver, gold, a gold bowl, a gold soup bowl, gold vessels, gold buckets and tin. So this is what Israel possessed. And they are bringing it to the king, Shalmaneser III. Here we have two Assyrian officials and three bearers from Israel with silver, gold vessels and tin. This was a tremendous discovery. Remember, this was discovered at Nimrut by Layard and transported to the British Museum. So you can see it there on the black obelisk. Eventually, there is personal contact. Here you've got Jehu with the king, Shalmaneser III. You know, they must have discussed a few things, politics, finances, and maybe religion. And maybe he asked Jew about the beliefs, his beliefs. This is a very interesting site. It's called uh, Ras Shamra or Yogarit. Tremendous clay tablets were discovered here. And new light was shed on the, on the Psalms in the Bible. Not too far from Yogarit, in Syria, another discovery was made concerning Adat Nirari III. Remember I said this, I believe, is the Syrian king that converted at the preaching of Jonah. While doing research on the life of Paul in Latakia, right here you can see some of it, <clears throat> I came across the following two words in Turkey. And I want you to translate it for me. There it is. Archaeology. Moses. <laughs> what does it tell you? This is a museum. And when I come across a museum in the Middle East, I'm inside because I'm searching for related material which I can couple with Bible stories. This is what I saw, but is there something a bit older? And then I came across this clay tablet, but I was looking for something still older. And what a glorious, unforgettable moment! When I saw this, it's all about Adat Nirari the third, the king who I believed converted at the preaching of Jonah. Let me read you something about the Antakaya Stila, <coughs> erected by our friend as a boundary marker, Kuduri between the realms of two of his vassal kings, and here you've got the names of the two, Atar Shumki of Arpat and Zakur of Hamat. I've been to Hamat. Beautiful place. He writes, Whosoever afterwards speak, speaks ill of the terms of this stila, and takes away by force this border from the possession of 
Atar Shumki, his sons or his grandsons, and destroys the written name and writes another name. So here you see his fairness. Don't take what does not belong to you. And then he concludes with the following words which struck me. Not listen to his prayers. Don't listen to his prayers if he disobeys. So here I discovered that he was a man who believed in prayer. Do you believe in prayer? That's a wonderful key to unlock the treasures of God's storehouse. As polytheist at this stage, he believed in prayer. Can you guess what came to my mind when I read these words? Will he one day become a monotheist and pray to one God, the God of Jonah? Do you still remember the name of the Israelite king that Adat Nirari III mentions in the Tel El Rima, Stila? Can you remember the name? Let's read it again. 2 Kings 13.2 And he, Joash, did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not there from. Now remember, Adat Nirari and Joash had contact and Joash had to pay tribute to him. So they were contemporaries. Now we can put him in the setting which the Bible gives us. Every transgression carries its own punishment. God does not punish you. Your deeds punish you. And me. God is a good God. He wants us to enjoy good health and prosperity. Verse 3. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel and he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. Now Elijah, the prophet, had contact with these two kings of Damascus. So this Joas is in trouble. He was naughty, disobeyed the Lord, and he got his own punishment. Now would somebody save him from these mighty enemies, kings of Damascus? Would there be somebody to save him? Would there be somebody to save us when we're in dire straits? Here's Loretta at the courtroom in Samaria where Joash lived and ruled, the wicked king, who had contact with Adad Nirari III. What is God's anger and is there pardon for sin, I'm asking my child? This is a very interesting subject. Verse 4. Joash pleaded with the Lord. It's about all we can do, eh? <laughs> when we've made a mess. Pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord listened to him. He listens to fallen people. For he saw the oppression of Israel because the king of Syria oppressed them. That's Damascus. He felt so sorry. When you're in a mess, he feels sorry about you. Verse 5. Look what God did. And then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer. Beautiful. So that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians. And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. A deliverer. Now will we find a king whose name means deliverer? If we can find him, this will be great stuff. The Assyrian annals say that Adat Nirari III is Akkadian name, Nararu. 
means to help. It's a redeemer, it's a deliverer, defeated the mighty Ben Hadad of Damascus. So Adat Nirali's name means deliverer. Joash was praying for a deliverer and God sent a man who he contacted before, Adat Nirali III, to deliver him. So the name of this king means to help a redeemer, a deliverer. So he came and he defeated the enemies of Joash. Was he aware of the fact that his victory was an answer to prayer? I think if they had emails those days, Joash would have sent him an email. Was God preparing this Assyrian king for conversion? Did someone tell him <coughs> of the prophet Elisha, who had close ties with King Jehoash? Please read the story. Did Adadni Rali the third hear of the prophecy of Elisha and the three victories <coughs> over Damascus? I think so. The Bible states that he conquered Damascus. Joash prayed, God sent him a deliverer. Can the stealer of Tel al Rima confirm the authenticity of the Bible? Yes. What a discovery. Now we know in which time of Israel's history this king reigned. Joash, his son's name was Jerobeam. Against Aram, Syria, I marched. Mari, king of Aram, now this is Adatni Rari writing. King of Aram, Mari is another name for king. I shut up. Remember, Joas prayed for a deliverer, and this is what happened. The terrifying splendor of Ashur, the national god of the Syrians, overwhelmed him. And he laid hold of, hold of my feet and became my vassal. His prayer was answered. So, Adat Nirali III was sympathetic towards an Israelite king and his prophets. 2,300 talents of silver, 20 talents of gold, 3,000 talents of copper, 5,000 talents, and it goes on and on and on. So he got all this wealth because of a prayer of Joash. He says, in Damascus, his royal city, in his palace, I received a temple dedicated to Nabu was discovered in the ruins of Nimrud. This was a tremendous discovery. Two statues dedicated to Nabu guarded the entrance. Here you can see it before it was destroyed. One of them was discovered and uh, today it's in the British Museum. Have a look at the position of the hands of the statue. See this? This was a sign of respect when you go into a temple. I like this. Be humble when you come to the house of God to praise Him, not yourself. The names Adat Nirali III and his mother Samurat, Samuramat, can be read on the statue. She was also called Semiramus. She was very famous. Now, Nabu was the god of the written word, like the Logos of which chapter 1 of John speaks. You are looking at an image that reveals monotheistic tendencies of this great king. Oh, 
You know, these things make me so excited. Just something else before we read about the characteristics of Nabu, the god that would, was worshipped here at Nimrud. Listen to Adat Nirari's description of Nabu. He writes, To Nabu, the powerful, the exalted child of Esagila, surpassing in wisdom, the powerful prince, son of Budimut, whose word takes precedence, master of the arts, guardian of all heaven and earth. Can you get sounds of the God you worship here? It says, all-knowing, omnipotent, omniscient. Can you see the characteristics of the God of the Old Testament, New Testament, whose mind is open, literally of wide ear. You know, when you pray to God, his ear is open to you. Who holds the writing reed, who possesses a clasping hand. Isaiah speaks of God's hand. The merciful. Hey, listen to this. The approachable says, come unto me, no matter who you are, approachable. From whom are the beautification, enlightenment and founding of human habitation. The beloved of Enlil, Lord of Lords, whose might has no equal, without whom no counsel is given in heaven, the merciful, the compassionate, whose forgiveness is kindly, who dwells in Ezida, which is Kala, Nimrut. You know, I think his, his concept of a monotheistic God was still in its early stages. But here he speaks of a kind God. The great Lord, his Lord, for the life of Adat Nirari, king of Assyria, his Lord and for the life of Samu Ramat, Semiramis, his mother, the royal lady, his lady, Bel Tarsi Iluma, governor of Kala, Amedi, Sirgana, Temeni, La Luna, for his own life, life of his soul. Length of days, many years, the peace of his house and his people, for deliverance from sickness, God is the great healer, have made and presented this statue. And now, my friends, for the stunning climax, an appeal to forsake Assyrian gods, polytheism, and worship only one god, monotheism. To change from polytheism, worshipping many gods in ancient times, to monotheism, this was something. And dangerous as well. Now the climax ends like this. Oh man, and this is for everybody who reads the message. Who shall come after me and you and I are after him? On Nabu, wait. Wait on this monotheistic God. Do not trust in another God. Wow. The most powerful monotheistic statement in ancient history, where a monothe monotheist, a worshipper of a, of a hundred gods, false gods, come and say, do not trust another god in the pantheon of Assyrian gods. Trust only in one god. This we call monotheism. A strange religious revolution took place in the time of Adat Nirari III, which can be compared with that of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten. And here you see 
him and Nefertiti, with their daughters, they had six daughters, Mekitaten, Meritaten, Nefer, Neferu, Aten, and Ankin, Sinpaten. Aten points you to the invisible creator God. So what happened in Assyria also happened in Egypt. For an unknown reason, Nabu, the god of Borsipa, and I climbed Borsipa, seems to have been proclaimed sole god, or at least the principal god of the empire. He's looking for, for trouble, like Nefertiti and Akhenaten. The favorite place accorded Nabu in the religious life of Assyria is revealed by the fact that no other god appears so often in personal names. This monotheistic revolution had a short had as short a life as the art and revolution in Egypt at Tel El Amarna. The worshippers of the Syrian national deities quickly recovered from their impotence, reoccupied their privileged places and suppressed Nabu. This is the reason that so little is known concerning the events during the time of the monotheistic Revolution. Tremendous info. Biblic, biblic, biblical chronology places Jonah's ministry in the time of Jeroboam the second of Israel, who reigned from 793 to 753, and his father's name, Joash. Nineveh have occurred in the reign of Adatnirari the third and have had something to do with his decision to abandon the old gods and serve only one deity. Here you've got all the facts. Jonah 1 verse 1 and 2 says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is Come up before me. Jonah, I want to destroy them. You know about the wickedness and the cruelness of this people. I want to destroy them. But Jonah, I'd rather save them than destroy them. Loretta, how did Jonah react to the call to come to preach here where you are standing on the walls of Nineveh? She says to me, I think he was excited to come and evangelize the metropolis of the ancient world. Was he? Verse 3, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He came down, 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 till he landed in the bottom of the ocean. This is what happens when we run away from God. It's a downward spiral. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Are you running away from God? He's going to catch up with you. I love the Lord we serve. This is what Jonah saw cruelty of the Assyrians. Have you studied the Assyrian history of that time, Jonah? Yes, I have. I don't want to do anything to do with cruel people. Look at how they treated the exiles. They walked naked. This is the picture Jonah had of the cruel Assyrians. Isaiah 23 and 4, the Assyrians forced the captives to walk naked and barefoot. Oh, God, you want me to go there? <laughs> We're looking at scenes of Assyrian cruelty that Jonah saw. Look at this. Killing, brutally killing people. Assyrian cruelty was shocking. I haven't shown you much, but it was shocking. 
No one really cares about them, except one who loved them so much that he died on Calvary for the cruelest nation who ever lived on the face of this earth. God loves cruel people and he wants to convert them to kind people. Jonah had to learn the lesson of God's love for sinners in a very hard manner. Read the book of Jonah. It's a very short book. It's so precious. 3 verse 1 and 2. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Remember when God reprimands you, he also give you the solution. He, he exposes his heart of love when he reprimands us. The Lord is so patient with Jonah, Nineveh, and who else? You and me. He's so patient with us. There is always a second time a second time, and a second time. Jonah experienced the second times of God, and he's speaking to you and me. There is a second time. Don't let the devil tell you you've gone too far. There is a second time, and a second time, and a second time. You know, when I married my wife, I said to her, I'll never fight with you, because I grew up in a house where mom and dad fought day and night. But you know, eventually I fought with her. I had a fight. Not a physical one, a verbal one. I said, please God, forgive me. I've prayed this prayer millions of times. <laughs> I'm still praying it. But this is God. We can always come to him when we failed. Verse 3 and 4, Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city, the Nergal Gate, a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So, if you don't convert, you'll be destroyed. God wants to save you. Can you see the somewhat nervous Jonah entering through one of the 15 gates, this is a narrow gate, started to preach. The greatest preacher in history, with the greatest success, 120,000 people. What we see is what he saw when he walked in Nineveh. All these Lam Lamus Lamasus, these great bulls. How would the people of Nineveh respond to his evangelistic call to repentance. Not to mention the cruel king. Jonah is in for the greatest surprise in the history of evangelism. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Monotheists. Believing God. He must have portrayed God as a very loving God not like their cruel gods, and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. They wore beautiful dresses. <laughs> and now they were in sackcloth, repenting. Sackcloth, sackcloth, ashes. The shops didn't sell beautiful dresses. Sackcloth was the dress of the day in their repentance. 120,000 of them. Jonah could not believe his eyes. But God knew that they were ready to listen to the message of salvation. Therefore he sent Jonah. Maybe God is sending you to somebody you think is not approachable. Has God's grace surprised you? <laughs> grace is not about 
logic. Have you seen wicked people becoming kind people? I've seen it so many times. Don't give up on people. Angry, cruel humans became and become like little lambs, as you see in this Assyrian relief. How would Adatni Rari III react to this religious revolution, seeing his people getting converted to monotheism? Well, he had some monotheism in his head. There was just another step to take. Verse 6. For word came unto the king of Nineveh. Hey, they told him the message that this man is preaching. And what did he do? And he arose from his throne, from where he ruled the world. And he laid his robe from him, took off his royal clothes, took it off, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. <laughs> so the king and the people looked the same, they had the same dress. What a miracle. This is what God can do to people, the cruelest people on the planet. He can do it for you and me. Unbelievable. Any other royal conversions? Yes, Nebuchadnezzar was one of them. That's another lecture. You know, as I walked across the ruins of the city, I thought of the king, the king who converted. Verse 7, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast Herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed, nor drink water. This is the king speaking. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence, violence, yeah, violence, that is in their hands said to his people, I'm going to convert. Join me. Verse 9. Who can tell, says the king, Adat Nirari III, if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. You know, he listened to the message of Jonah and he discovered, well, Jonah's God is a merciful God. He sought maybe with Elijah and Elisha and other prophets, Amos and Hosea. God's reaction to their sorrow and repentance. Verse 10, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, cruelty, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. What a story. I looked at these tyrants who changed into obedient, God-fearing people and marveled at God's grace. God wants to change you and me into kind people. He can do it if we allow him. The song says it took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he cleansed my soul, made me whole, it took a miracle of love divine. This world needs kind people, not cruel people. I challenge you, to allow God to make you a little kinder. The king did what the Bible says we must do. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Does this also apply to big sinners like me, like you? Yes. Looking out of my hotel a window onto the Tigris River, I wondered, I wondered, did he baptize the king and all his people down there? I wonder. I would love to meet Nebuchadnezzar and Adatni Rali the third in heaven one day and listen to their conversion story. May I ask you a very big favor? I want to meet you there in the land with zero crime. Zero crime. And unlimited, unlimitable peace of mind. Can we clinch this deal, this date, to meet one another in a happy land? All we've got to do is say, God, I need you. I'm sorry. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading? Pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? Mercies for you and for me. Time is now fleeting. The moments are passing. Passing from you and from me. A few moments just passed by. Shadows are gathering. Deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. And then the refrain says, Come home. Come home. You who are weary, come home earnestly, tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Father in heaven, thank you for a voice calling, come home. Help us to listen to the voice and leave the mess we're in and enjoy the warm friendship of your home, your love, and your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.